Garden gi legmon pana, zenbu ningdo porsing, rewang gi jagdo pana, kezu gi boba shawe. Su gang mixung gi chimar shambe, kungi nasuki kumbur diwe, dagi kawajin, shatter tartar gi minamia. Materin lugu gi kezu spudi, kegi tango, motion ye. Materin kele jene, lasso gi keje re, pachin shu. I am a Tibetan, a product of the occupation of my home by a foreign power and being exiled here in India and resistance every day of my life uh, for freedom. And uh, what I write is a reflection of my reality. Uh, the first poem is called Banishment. Banishment. Away from home, I leap in my 36th rented room with a trapped bee and a three-legged spider. Spider crawls on the wall and I on the floor. Bee bangs at the window and I on the table. Often we stare at each other, sharing our pool of loneliness. They paint the wall with the droppings and webs. I give them isolated words. Net, maze, tangle, wings, buds, flutter. Away from home, I live. Away from home, my minutes are hours. Spider travels from the window to the ceiling. Bee flies from the window to the bean. I stare out of the window. Neither speaks each other's tongue. I wish you would go deaf before my silence. Uh, this, I was smuggled out of Tibet when I was about 10. My mother was in her early 30s then, and she's in her early 70s now, and we haven't met for over 30 years. And uh, the poem that, that I'm going to read now is an imaginary conversation with my mother, and I would like to request Mona Zodia to be my mother for a few minutes. Uh, this is called, When Was I Born? Mother, when was I born? In the year the river dried. When was that? That was the year when crops failed and we went hungry for many days. We feared that you would never survive. Was that the year you, we moved to a new house? That was the year when they confiscated our house and divided it among the patriotic party members. We were, we were banished to the cow shed where you were born. What year was that? That was the year when they destroyed the monastery, melted all the bronze images to make bullets. You were born when dust filled the sky. Was that the year Grandpa went away? That was the year when they sent your grandfather to prison, where he cleaned shit and butchered insects in the fields. You were born when there were no men in our house. Was I born in the year the walls were pulled down? That was the year when they ripped apart the prayer hall. Wooden beams were hammered to splinters and frescoes soiled. You were born when a crazy wind blew from the east. What year was that? That was the year they burned scriptures in the village square and sang revolutionary songs in praise of the party. You were born when blades of grass refused to grow. Was that the year you stopped singing? That was the year. They took our neighbor to the hard labor camp when she sang a traditional song while digging a canal. You were born when people disappeared one after another. What year was that? That was the year they wrote the big red slogan on the walls 
Heads that stick out will be hammered down. You were born when the sun shied away from our sky. What year was that? That was the year when your father, your father. At any point in our life, if we close our eyes for a minute and ask ourselves, who are we? I wonder what happens. And especially for a refugee like me who was forced out of his home when he was, was very young and having to live in another country, uh, identity uh, is the central confusion in my head. And uh, the poem that I'm going to read now has something to do with that. It's called I. Who am I? Riverbank, mud house, my mother's eyes, my father's throat, garden of willows, pigeons pregnant, dust that flakes the altar invading sacred spaces. Here in the plains, there is no yak dung, just empty water bottles, no barley fields, only smoking cars. Yellow stars look down on my mother's sky. Barley has turned into wheat. Cabbages have stolen the fields from round radish. My grandfather's summer bag is fled. Who am I? A book? A pen? Talking about the snows of the land, thinking of the land of snow. Words deny me the smell of my mother's milk. Sheep droppings. Haystacks, fats of my heart have left, barren void, yellow dreams, numb thought. The milkman has come knocking. 560 rupees for this month. Half circle, full triangle, new moon. I have lived in too many rented rooms. What I need is a home, a shoe rack fixed to a wall. Who am I? A hair of a dog stuck on barbed wire, a parcel of dried chura, packed, sealed, stamped, shipped, a nomad tent pitched low like impermanence, hanging on the plateau, dead soil, dread day, flat peaks, smoke dot, hoof spot, musket shot. Some liberations do come from green chilies. Wi fire, white walls, pine needles, doormat. I am Kesar's war horse, living on Milarepa's nettle broth, playing with the words that mean and do not mean. Uh, <laughs> the next one is called A Song from a Distance. This was written for a Tibetan writer based in Beijing uh, many years ago. A song from a distance for Wese. My body is trapped in a heated room. Light shines from the ceiling. A leather sofa invites me to let my spine relax. But my heart runs through that river by the village, that bridge made of leather thongs rocking with the wind. That dusty yard where I was tied to a boulder where mother worked in the field every day. Here, gray houses stare at me, people on the train, frozen, edgy, tired, lonely, lost, wished for other versions of their lives. My mind runs to that river, that village by the Scorpion Hills, where the willow trees whistle, where I once sat a farmer's heart on fire. I am now a hair of a dandelion flying with wind. What about you, my rebel? I see that you too are trapped in a far corner of a mad city under stars shimmering bright yellow. Does your sofa invite you, or is it the eyes on the wall that watch every twitch of your muscles? 
I see that your heart runs away to your home in the mountains where under the blue sky pointed stars watch. From a distance I sing, you and I are a fragment of an arrow shot forth from Kesar's bow. You and I are ears of barley watered by Yelung River. Every day when I open the internet, my heart fears that there will be news of your disappearance. Like Dolma Kapp into a cell before his Himalaya on fire could be born to a family of books. Like Jamianki taken away unseen soon after she produced the evening news. Like that opera master captured in darkness before his songs became one with the wind. Like that old woman from Pago who disappeared with her prayer will. From a distance I sing, you and I are pieces of a broken pot in which Millet ever boiled his nettles. You and I are fronds of a juniper tree fragrant in the hills of Anyamachin. Here in exile, my wrinkles deepen. The leaves fall from the trees. You will sharpen your pen in that city where each of your words are measured, each breath checked, each step followed. But your pen dances with the tales which come to me in another tongue. From a distance, I sing, you and I are fragmented words in a poem Gindin Shumbi wrote in his prison cell. You and I are chipped pieces of Yun sword that pierce the April night. One day, you and I will have a bowl of thukpa in the dingy house of a hotel. One day, you and I will be snow lions roaming the mountains of Yanjin Tangla. This is called A Room Without a Door. My window is small. In the night, I see stars, precisely five in number. Four of them smaller in fear cling to the big one. Could one star bully another? My window is small. In the daytime, I see flowers, precisely two in number, one yellow and the other red, in regimental attention, oblivious to the whistling wind which shouts command at them. My window is small, too small to invite the whistling wind, but the dust, like ghost, crowds in, forming a thin film on which I write. How can you come to read? I am in a room without a door. Uh, too many dark poems. I will uh, read one, which is uh, hopefully slightly lighter. We have had the World Cup uh, football uh, tournament last month, so this uh, poem is written on that. It's called a one-on-one. -on, -one. on a green pitch, Buddha dribbles hard. His bundle of hair falls, Buddha the long-haired football star. Rains pour, heaven rejoices. Ronaldo, the tall, muscular footballer, football star, steals the ball, steals the crowd, and the game. Buddha, zero. Ronaldo, one. Buddha beams a compassionate smile and summons up all his manifestations, sets the ball in motion. The crowd roars and shrieks, 11,000 Buddhas dribbling 11,000 balls. Ronaldo stands Agimbo, looks at the black robed referee, who is but counting, 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 counting 11,000 goals scored. Buddha, 11,000, Ronaldo, won. After a game at a bar, Ronaldo sits dejectedly sipping his Bloody Mary. Buddha comes with his backing bowl. Over a plate of french fries, Ronaldo asks us, what is the secret of your goal scoring? Buddha beams a compassionate smile and says, it's all in your mind. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, this, uh, this session is uh, titled, uh, For the Love of My Language. And then I was thinking that I don't actually 
uh, <laughs> right in Bezo. So uh, I'll be reading a, a few poems. And uh, before I read the first one, which is, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a poem. Uh, in Mizoram, uh, we used to have total prohibition. And I can tell you that if your government in your state ever tries to impose it, please tell them it is a very bad idea. Because, uh, you know, people are such that in a, a place where something is forbidden, those who are on top, the haves, they are going to be having everything and without any consequences to them. And what happens is that uh, the have-nots, the people who don't have money or connections, but they still want drinks, they are the ones who get caught and thrown in jails and fined and penalized and whatnot. So anyway, uh, th that used to be the case. So I wrote this poem. It's not exactly about prohibition as such, but uh, it's one of the things. Uh, it used to be, it, it has created a culture or rather an ethos where drinking or so on is regarded as extremely uh, shameful and all that. So this, is, uh, this poem is titled, What Poetry Means to a Nestina in Peril. What should poetry mean to a woman in the hills? What should poetry mean to a woman in the hills? As she sits one long sloping summer evening in Patria, eyes all, her head cramped with contrary winds, pistoling the clever stars that seem to say, ignoring the problem will not make it go away. So what if Ernestina is not a name at all, not even a corruption, less than a monument, she will sit, pulling on one thin cigarillo after another. She will lift her teacup in friendly greeting to the hills and the loquacious stars. And the music will comb on through her hair, telling her, poetry must be raw, like a side of beef. It should drip blood. It should remind you of sweat and dusty slaughter and the epidermal crunch and the sudden bullet to the head. The sudden bullet in the head. So she sits calmly gathered. The lizard in her blinks and thinks she will answer. The dog was bad that bit me. And later they cut off my third eye and left it in a jar on hospital shelf. That was when the drums began. Since then, I have met the patron saint of sots and seriousness who used to stand in every corner until the police chased her down and she jumped into a taxi. Now I have turned into the girl with the black guitar and it was the dog who died, such as blood. The rustle, the rustle of Ernestina's skirt will not reveal the sinful vine or cicada crumbling to a pair of wings at her feet. She will smile and say, I like a land where babies are ripped out of their graves, where the church leads to practical results like illegitimate children and broken marriages, quite out of proportion to the current population. And your neighbor is kidnapped by demons and the young wither without complaint. And pious women know the sexual ecstasy of dance and peace is kept by short men with a Bible and five big knuckles on their righteous hands. Religion has made drunks of us all. We are killing ourselves. I like an incestuous land. Stars, be silent. Let Ernestina speak. So what if the roses are in disarray? She will rise with a look of terror to real to be comical. The conspiracy in the greenhouse and the committee of good women, they have marked her down. They're coming. They're coming. We have been bombed silly out of our minds. Waiter, bring me something cold to drink. 
Somewhere there is a desert waiting for me, and someday I will walk into it. That's one. Okay, uh, next one, I have to give a little context again. Sorry about that. Uh, we used to have an oral tradition of uh, storytelling and poetry uh, songs, rather. And there was a very legendary woman. She is, in fact, said to be our first poet. Pimwaki, we would call her. Uh, she was so prolific, in fact, uh, that, uh, as the legend goes, they buried her alive with a gong, you know, uh, we used to have, we have these brass gongs that we uh, beat as we chant the poems, the poetry. So they buried her alive because they said that if we don't do that, if she keeps on living, we will have no more songs to compose. She will have composed everything. So this poem is actually, uh, in a sense, about her because, you know, uh, the thought of a woman, our very first poet, who was buried alive, and yet the tradition of poetry did not die with her. So this is sort of, it's about that. So that's the context in which this next poem, which I'm going to read, is about. This is a girl with black guitar and blue hibiscus. The reality of music is a problem waiting to be solved by the black guitar not the girl, nor the jug of blue hibiscus. The pigeons are insane with grief because you left the den. The clouds will be noble and distant as always. The scent of citrus flowers will fade in soft explosions. And the girl will put a blue hibiscus in her hair. And the computer will speak in flawless Japanese talking of the elegant instant and how the quasars are forever expanding. How the jealousy of common stuff finds itself fully in an uncommon criminal act. In the red earth, lay her like a seed. The sad gong will go on accusing until it becomes the black guitar and music becomes a cleft of a certain color waiting for the first quiver of strings until the gong is quiet and the woman in the earth has gone to sleep. Okay, okay um, I was thinking that uh, although I don't really write in Mizu, uh, I thought I'd give you a sample of one of our very famous songs. Uh, it's, most of our songs are either about uh, the Bible, or it's about love and longing and all that. This one is one of the latter, and it has been composed by P.S. Chong Thu. Uh, he was one of our very, um, very beloved musicians and lyricists, a songwriter. So this is, uh, this is, I'll just read it out in my language and give you a gist of it. Samang <laughs> Chendi. Samang chen ni te zong, lo her tsuak le chi ne. Ami leeng to na hyan, tuardan tuardan shil tiam am om mo. Du lai leeng zing zin tur, na neem liing par an lan. Ngil lo nan se rang cham, cham te tak ang mo. Ngil lo shukmai shui tu di, Tunan low parts wake in chen di low hair tang lung len dum ten toy nan. Vankosira said I chewa palkara. Kialai knock in a low par roll ball reibe. So this is a, a song that, is, that has been composed for a lover who is leaving the village. And uh, it's, it's saying that the days of parting have come around again when we must part like hair, you know, a woman's long hair that parts. And uh, there's a flower there, a forget-me-not. Gilopar means forget-me-not, although I'm not sure that it's the actual forget-me-not. So that is blooming there, and you put it in your hair in remembrance of me. So that was just a sample of uh, my language.
since uh, to keep in with the theme of the panel. And uh, I think that'll be all because I'm taking up a, a lot of time. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. I think, I think, okay, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the Bangalore F Festival for inviting me. It's great to see so many people here. So I'm going to start with the title poem of my book, uh, Date Palms. Date Palms. When the clock struck your outstretched palm at six, day was the color of a clay-skinned dhakti, night a dark crackpot. Girlhood stopped at the stroke of eleven. Day was a white-hot moon, night a blood-red scene. For sixteen, the digits had no time, left you to do all the talking with your sticky fingers. On the lifeline of that other shore, your mother tongue became a threadbare heirloom, weaving in and out of traffic. How aptly its catch-all Kal sums up your middle age, where yesterday and tomorrow have the same name. Day is the color of half, and half a cloudy presence hides your past. Drink it down, stare at the grounds. Night is the taste of lost earth. This is called Meter Taxi. Staccato and vibrato are twinned parts of wordless speech. The tuk-tuk takes time and cuts it so fine past my fellow travelers. What's in a line that has lost its meter, spilled into a haggle of currency? Language as bone of contention dogs me. Past a gaggle of tourists, the eye taxis, conscious of the self as other, yet greedy for the grasp of a phrase to imbibe living taxonomy, gestures to, flat, to flesh the flattened picture postcard cityscape. Let the earth bear witness that the poet is Buddha's mudra, the hand that touches dirty ground, lexicon of taxing times, mixing dank and frangipani with a taxidermist's eye. Thank you. When the apocalypse finally happens. When the apocalypse finally happens, you will be standing in knee-deep water trying to fish out the ring that slipped from your wedding finger into the seaweed-muddled pond that is choking all the koi and water lilies. Not because spring came too early, rather dampness never really left, like that nasty cough nesting in your bronchioles from 17 summers ago when you camped out overnight on the beach in Bontoc with your crazy lover and the morning tide swept over both of you like a blanket made of ice-cold 
needles. Acupuncture once a week might help the wheezing. You tried it once, marveling at the strange precision of the pain, somewhere in between a twinge of regret and an uneasy premonition. When the apocalypse finally happens, gold will be worthless anyway. Might as well get used to it, that blank band, the color of loss, your hand, a life lived, unlived. Thank you. Now I'm going to read from pointillism, or rather pointillism. It's a hybrid word I made up. Tillism means magic in Urdu. The Gulabi Guavas of Allahabad. You came to this fabled confluence from the land of green and white guavas, hard, fleshed, brood, cousin from across, hot under the collar, haste-carved border that marked you as other. The hawker in civil lines outside El Chico's was making a pyramid of winter's bright, blushing beauties, singing their praises in your dead father's cadence. The first time he flayed an Ilahabadi Amrud open, offered you a wound pink cheek with an unforgettable fragrance, that is when you knew the tenor of your hunger, what it means to come back, take a bite out of your own lost history. This is called Chappan Churi. Uh, so there, there's, a, there's a famous uh, Tumri singer called Chappan Churi from Allahabad, and uh, her name was Janki Bai, and after she survived uh, stabbings, she was thereafter famously known as Chappan Churi, which means 56. You might be familiar from Chappan, this is the Modi one's you know, 56 inch chest, anyway. <laughs> Chappan Churi. The jilted's 56 stabbings could not kill Janki Bai, thereafter known as Chappan Churi. When I type Churi, autocorrect is also a stab at language, giving me the option of cherry, char, sherry, churn, churl, chi, and occasionally chai. A conjoined cup I sip, walk a tightrope of English Urdu. One, one foot in each bone chini, my lines are burning fiercely. Like Janki, each wound giving me a brand new mouth. This is called Ode to Opposable Thumbs. When the spent maternal nipple slipped away from baby fingers, there you were, flesh and plum, perfect plop in mouth. That cave would remain your domain for years. Even now, the passage is marked by two strapping bucks guarding the gate of the gazelle's leap into metaphor. Flicking a marble the size of a blue-eyed planet fleeing a blind universe, where would I be without you, thumbs, wrestling on childhood's tabletops? 
You fought to make my imprint while I flooded your labyrinths with ink stamped at roadside notaries, consent under duress, the rule of thumb all around me, illiterate, oppressed. Are we not all thumbnails filed away and forgotten under time's thumb? Ode to a Scar, Lonely Signpost, most days I turn away from you, avert my gaze. Who wants to dwell on unloveliness, tether? Yet there is an undertow in the welting, the warp and weft that looms, that, that knits Written on the body, its poundage betrayed, calligraphy of missive missile. Sacred scar, I wanted to interpret you like a dream, leisurely, like one would unwind, a gauze wrapped heirloom, interrupted flesh. But you became a cheeky meteor shooting scar, firing fusillades of synapses. Now, geography, history, and memory burn within your crossbones, scar. On the surface, you recede to a whisper. It is only in the unseen caverns of my cheek that you howl like a wolf at the many moons of my teeth. In the margins. At the barber shop, vintage model airplanes made out of beer cans hang from the ceiling, suspended in time. I recognize a tiger moth circa World War II, the same plane my mist-blinded father crashed in 1969, nose down in the fragrant tea gardens outside Silhat, slipping three discs on his lower back. The pain would come when least expected, keeping memory fresh, it was I who would bend to pick up his dropped papers, thread his rambling thoughts, scribble my own, silently, all the while, in the margins. The Department of Wronged Rights. You have made a wrong right turn because left is right here, and we just wanted to drive that point home. Your life is wood, get the drift? This is now a checkpoint. Please to sit. While you wait, we will check you in a box, in triplicate. BBG, are you by any chance that Adhakara's sister? You mean the one who still lives on the tip of her tongue tied in brackets of silence, stuffed in her straight-faced helplessness? Mutation would require you to visit another office. We only mince words here, on stamp paper. It doesn't matter if you can sign your name. Thumbprints are necessary. Only the right thumb is right. Would you look at the price of pomegranates? Tell me, how can a simple officer possibly raise one's family in this mehengai? Please have some biscuit with the chai. Where were we? Yes. I was going to tell you about Siagush, the Supari Jin. It is he who cracks your nuts into a heart. 
he who folds your teeth into paper-thin walls of limestone, your legs into eighths of red ochre, he who breaks your spine into a moist green triangle spiked with nails of clove, he who offers the bite of bruised bright cardamom shot through with the tracery of electric moonlight jammed down your throat. Benevolent or evil, it depends on which way the whim blows. You must not only believe he exists, but solemnly attest before we can continue, before you pass. Out of any port, you must solemnly attest before you pass out. Shall we continue? Okay, do I have time for one last poem? I think I would like to read the title poem of the book, Point Thilism. Shot is a collective term for small balls. The Diablo is the most common. Its rapid flyer explodes hundreds of pellets from a single point and shoot. Soft shell of his body sieved into unreadable braille. In film negatives, light is dark. Here is your ticket to the theater of opposites. Hole punched like a stapled memo, back to back the black stars light up the night skies of Kashmir, maps of occupation made flesh, pulled the trigger. It was then that you joined the dots of death and came to a point blank conclusion. Now, you are a diviner of voodoo words, orisha of pushpins, barbs, skewers, to impale at pinpoint the lifelong timelines of lies. Not just there, but here and here. Outrage is borderless, the way it possesses, like love or fire. Zoom into the blind spot. This is the beginning of your point the sharp-tongued end to your means. Thank you.